tonight, a phone almost gets dropped in a bath. Ooh. I drop a piece of paper, and some LEDs turn on. Ooh, it does. Why, hello there, and welcome back. This is part 12 of my build vlog of the Trumpeter 1 to 200 scale model of the Titanic. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the lighting, which I finally managed to get around to installing into the boat, and also my finalising of the electronics before my first test in the water. Things like balancing the electronics out across the boat so it remains stable. So without any further ado, I will crack on with what I've been up to. So here I'm just doing a little bit more fiddling around with electronics, and this is my relay, um, which as I was saying in the last episode, uh, is able to sort of cut the main power to the boat. Um, and what I've done is I've attached it to an external 12 volt battery. And the reason for this is that I'm a bit worried, you know, the sensitive electronics and stuff in here. And I'm a bit worried if I connected it to the main batteries uh, of the actual boat, there's a danger that any ripple that's caused by the motors turning off and stuff may come and damage this electronics. So I've fitted it in with a, a, an independent battery system. Uh, and I'm just giving it a little test here to see if it works. So here's my key fob. And as you see, you can hear that sort of click. That's the relay opening and closing. So when the red light's on, bizarrely, that means the boat is unlocked, uh, which what, what it'll mean is that there's continuity. I think I'll get a, something sharp I can point with. That means that there's continuity, current can flow, between this pin and this pin. When I lock the boat, it means that there's continuity between this pin and this pin. So what I need to do, I want the boat to work in an unlocked condition, so I need to put my main feed into these two pins here. And that means that when the boat's locked, there's no continuity, there's no current getting to the main circuits. When the boat's unlocked, there is continuity and current does get to the main circuits. The other thing that I did, and it's well worth doing this if you're anxious about battery power and battery um, operation time in your boat, it's well worth using your multimeter, if you've got one, and connecting it in series with one of your motors. Because what you can do is you can monitor the amount of current flowing through the motor and then you can make subtle adjustments in the motor to try to reduce the current as far as possible. And basically what this means is that you reduce your friction in the prop shafts to such a point that the motor is operating as effectively as possible and it's using as much of the energy from the batteries as possible and converting it into kinetic energy in the propellers. If you're using, if you spot higher current, what that probably means is that you've not quite got the alignment between the motor and your propeller shaft correctly. And what that'll end up doing is you'll end up wasting quite a lot of your energy as friction. So you're basically wasting your energy as heat. So it's well worth doing because you can end up saving a reasonable amount of energy, especially if you've got the boat in the water for an hour, you know, even a 0.1 of an amp will actually add up over the course of an hour's operation. Um, it's useful to do when you've got three motors as well, because you can sort of compare them. Realistically, the expectation is that all these motors will pull the same current. Now, in reality, in my boat, that's not the case, because the central propeller is directly in line with its propeller shaft. Whereas, as you can see, the two wing propellers are slightly out of line, because the space envelope doesn't quite allow them to be directly in line. And so because of that, you'd expect these two to pour slightly more energy than this one. But even so, you can still use the figures you get for each motor to make an educated guess. You know, if this one's pulling 0.8 of an amp, let's say, and this one's pulling an amp, you know that there's a, diff there's a problem with this one. Equally, if this one's only pulling half an amp and that one's pulling an eighth of an amp, there's a problem with this one. Uh, so it's quite a useful thing to do, and you can end up saving quite a lot of energy by doing this. Another thing that I've done since the last video is I have put my servo in for the rudder. As you can see, as the servo moves, the rudder moves. Nice and simple. Just a simple connector rod arrangement. 
the top of the rudder, I've actually used a servo horn, which I've glued in place. Uh, that then connects onto a stainless steel rod or actuator, I suppose, and then into the servo. And this connection is nice and simple, quite elegant because it's right at the back of the boat. Nothing else is really around here, but it works really nicely. As you can see, the, uh, the actual servo itself just happens to be exactly the same length as the resin stanchion that I made for the propeller shaft. Um, I'm joking, of course, it doesn't happen to be that at all. This is exactly how I designed it. Uh, quite a long time ago, again from CAD, uh, I knew these were the servos I was going to use. And as a result, I deliberately measured up this epoxy to be the right length to accommodate the servo. I've then used some five minute epoxy to bond some wooden stocks either side and the servo is attached via these bolts. The reason that I've put these wooden blocks in is because I don't really like permanently bonding things into the boat where I can help it. If this servo develops problems and stuff, it's a matter of undoing two screws to get access to it, remove it and replace it. And that's the same with a lot of things. For example, here, here's my smoke generator. And again, it's mounted, it's not yet glued down, but it's mounted on two wooden stocks. So if there is ever a problem with this, it's a matter of undoing two screws and I can remove the component completely. So I'm just about to start setting up my rudder. And to do that, I'm going to use my electrics, which is just perched over here. And for the first time, I'm going to turn on my servo. As you can see, I've taken the servo horn off the servo to start with, because I don't want it to... Sometimes when you turn on a servo, it'll reset to its normal position. And if that's too far, it might pull the rudder to an angle that I don't want it at. So I've disconnected it for now. So it's working now. See? Alarm's responding nicely, as is the rudder. If I try to get a better view of these, you can see that. Sorry, I think I got my fingers in the camera. There we are. So, right at the back of the boat, and the rudder responds nicely in both directions. So, happy days. So in this clip, I am painting the ship's anode strips. Um, normally I wouldn't go into this sort of engineering-y kind of detail, but to be fair, I think these are really cool, so I am, I'm going to on this occasion. Um, an anode strip is a sacrificial component, which is still used on ships to this day, uh, and it's designed to avoid an electrical phenomenon, which, if left unchecked, would end up with rapid corrosion of the ship's hull. So. When you have two different metals separated by an electrolyte, you essentially have a battery. That is the core principle of a battery, having two metals separated by an electrolyte. And in the case of the Titanic, you have exactly this, because you have the ship's ironwork, the hull, and the rudder are both made from iron. But then the ship's propellers are made from bronze, and they are separated from each other by salty water, which can act as an electrolyte. So what will happen is, you'll actually get a current flow across this. And in the case of the Titanic, the ironwork will quite literally give up some of its electrons, which will flow through the salt water to the bronze propellers. And that's really, really catastrophic, because what happens when iron loses its electrons is it corrodes, and it can corrode incredibly fast. And obviously that's the exact opposite of what you want. So to stop this happening, shipbuilders fit anode strips to their ships and an anode strip tends to be made out of zinc it needs to be made out of a reactive metal and essentially it needs to be a metal which will give up its electrons quicker than either of the two metals that you're trying to protect so the idea here is that the zinc anode strip which i'm painting on now would give up its electrons more readily than the iron in the hull work and therefore the iron won't corrode, but the zinc will. So it's a sacrificial component. Every, every so often, I don't really know how long these last, but every so often the ship would have to come in, it would get dry docked, and they would change out the anode strips for fresh ones. Obviously in the case of the Titanic, that never happened, um, but on most ships over their career, they would have anode strips replaced regularly. And that would ensure that the metal work on the ship does not corrode any quicker than it normally would. 
Obviously, in the case of my model, it's not a real anode strip, I'm just painting it on. Uh, but it does add that little bit more sort of scenic interest to the hull. Um, and I do, I, I think it's just a really interesting bit of engineering. You sort of, you wonder how on earth people realised this phenomenon existed in the first place. They must have just seen that ships were corroding very rapidly um, and worked out why. I do think it's really interesting though. In other painting news, I have finished my horse pipe and I have also painted the internals of the anchor ports red. So thank you to um, whoever put in the comments that they were meant to be red. I have now addressed that. For the rest of the video, I am going to talk about the ship's lighting. So what I've done here is I've wired up my lights to one of the radio control switches and that's now actually incorporated into my radio electronics. So what should happen is when I flick this switch, channel six, uh, these lights should turn on. But at the minute, we're getting a little bit of an issue. See, they ain't turning on. So there's something wrong. Now, I suspect I already know the reason for this, uh, but this is quite a good little bit of electrical debugging. So I thought I might include it in the video because it's not unlikely that other people have already come up against this issue. So here is my theory about what's wrong. These are powered from my receiver over here. And the receiver derives its power from my speed controller. I know that's a fairly convoluted way of doing it, but it does actually make things easier because all of these things run off five volts uh, and my batteries are 12 volts. So to sort of neaten things up, this has what's called a battery eliminator circuit inside it. And that is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a circuit that removes the need to have a battery. Basically, it's a voltage regulatory circuit and it steps the 12 volts down from the battery and turns it into five volts, which can be used to power the receiver, because obviously the receiver still needs power. Uh, and along with that, it can power all the things that require power coming from the receiver. For example, things like the servos, they need five volts. And in my case, also these two RC switches. The problem though, with having a voltage regulator circuit here means that theoretically there shouldn't be an issue but what it means is that what this sees as zero volts might not be exactly the same as this zero volts which is essentially the earth the uh, the, the, the neutral point on the battery so there may be a slight difference between zero volts there and zero volts there and because these have fairly sensitive electronics in them that might be enough to stop them working. So I'm going to do a little bit of debugging. I'm hope I'm, the, the plan for this shot is that you can see the multimeter and see what it says. We will see if that happens or not. So let's set multimeter to a fairly small range. And I'm going to test one of the zero volt pins on my receiver against zero volts on the boat. Let's see what we get. Ah, you see, so that's saying 4.2 difference. Now look, when I have my pins together, there's no difference, obviously. There's no difference potential-wise between these two things. If I put my pins on the neutral point on the battery and the neutral point on my main uh, motherboard, my main circuit board, we get 0.2, which is probably accounts for the resistance in the wire going from the main circuit board to the battery but when i go from the main point on the circuit board to neutral on the receiver we've got quite a genuine difference between the two zero volts so i suspect i'm still not certain but i suspect that is at least part of the issue so how can we solve this well the simplest way to solve it is to put a bond between my zero volt line here and one of the zero volts on the receivers. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'll put that in and then I'm going to test these RC switches again and see if they're still causing problems. Right, so here we are. I've now installed my neutral bond between my battery voltage 
and the battery eliminator circuit. So what I've done to achieve this is I've just used a, uh, a servo extension lead and I've just taken the, uh, the signal and the positive lines out and I've only left the negative line in or the neutral line and um, that's going into a spare channel that I'm not using. There we are. And then this lead goes all the way to my negative battery terminal here. So by doing that, I've bonded all neutrals in my circuit together now. So this theoretically should work. And this is the first time I've done it. So, well, uh, <laughs> let's see. So I should show you, I'm using channel seven, which is a rotary switch. That's gonna work. Oh, it does, happy days. So lights turn on. And then when I turn the switch the other way, lights go off again. Let's see if I can make this any more obvious. Delicious. Right. Well, there we are. They're good little things, these RC switches, actually. Um, I'm really impressed with them. And I'm particularly impressed because it's got a 10 amp rating, which is pretty significant. You know, you could run pretty much every auxiliary function you're ever going to want in a model, you could run off that pretty happily. And it, you know, it's pretty robust. There must be some fairly decent sized MOSFETs or something in there to be doing that. Um, so yeah, I'm quite impressed. Uh, the instructions aren't brilliant. Well, they're, they're all right. The instructions aren't very good at telling you about things like this earth bond. I keep saying earth bond, it's not an earth bond, it's a neutral bond. Anyway, they're not, the instructions aren't very good at explaining this bond. Um, so you have to be quite diligent at um, looking at the circuit diagrams. But once you have them up and running, it is quite a good little beta kit. And it's so much smaller than a relay or something like that. I mean, the old fashioned way of doing this would be to use a servo motor to activate a micro switch. But that's pretty clunky, pretty old fashioned, not very efficient and just not very elegant. And this is certainly an improvement on that. So now is the time for me to do my LED lighting install. And I've bought this stuff, which is a sort of very warmish white, because uh, I'm wanting to get that sort of filament bulb kind of colour. Um, and I didn't realise this until I actually received the package, but it comes with these rather cool little clips, which you sort of push in your LED strip into them like so, and then push your clip down over the top. And it gives you this quite elegant sort of solution to um, connecting them up, so I'm quite happy with that. So in this clip, I am attaching my LED strip into the hull. The LED strip comes with a sort of self-adhesive back on it, but I wasn't really prepared to trust that that would really stand the test of time. So I'm also using a fairly small amount of CA glue uh, just to make sure that the LEDs are properly bonded in place. I was debating for quite a long time about how many LEDs to use in this section of the boat because I'm just conscious that, you know, this is a 1912 ship. LED, excuse me, filament bulb lighting is a, a fairly modern phenomenon on board ships at this point. So I certainly don't want the ship to look too bright, you know, I don't want it to look like sort of James Cameron's Titanic movie, because although that looks great, it's not really particularly representative of what the Titanic would have looked like, you know, the bulbs would have been much yellower uh, and much less bright. So I'm going to be fairly sparing with the amount of LEDs that I use in this, uh, so I'm only going to do one single strip all the way around the hull, and I'm pretty confident that that will be more than enough for my purposes.
So, regarding bulkheads, I know a lot of people have been asking me in the comments when I'm going to fit these, and I've eventually settled on these ones from Titanic Honor and Glory. Um, they're 3D printed, as you can see, and it comes as a seven-part kit where you get four vertical bulkheads and then three horizontal bulkheads that sort of will stop twisting motion. And I, I chose these for a selection of reasons, really. I know there's there's a few options out there on the internet, and there was also the possibility of building them myself, but I thought for cost-wise, I thought these were really quite well-priced, and I thought in terms of the actual structure these are going to give, I thought these would be very useful. I also bought these because um, they're very thin, and that'll give me as best chance as possible at actually fitting them into my boat. As you will probably have seen from a lot of the electrical stuff I've done recently, the inside of my boat is unbelievably constrained. So the chances of me fitting all of these bulkheads in is very minimal. But because they're so thin, the likelihood is I'll be able to fit some of them in. Uh, and I'll be able to come up with, hopefully, a compromise that allows me to get enough reinforcing in without being able to do the entire set. That's the plan, anyway. It's likely that I might have to chop bulkheads up in places, you know, in, for example, in position one, I might not be able to use the entire bulkhead, but I might be able to use the top. In position two, I might be able to use the whole thing. In position three, I might only be able to use the bottom and not the sides. You know, it's a, it's a case of working out what I actually can get away with and going from there. And this is where the first bulkhead goes, just there. And what you can see I've done, I don't know if I can quite get the camera to focus on it, but what I've done is I've just cut the sort of gel which gives this LED strip its IP rating out for the section where the bulkhead will pass through. And I've done the same on the other side, there. Now I've bought these bulkheads from a Titanic honor and glory which i will leave in the description and i've just edited them slightly to allow them to fit over my motors like so so i'll go and add these in now so just in the process of sorting out the electronics i have used my bulkhead as a place to do some wire routing so i've got a cable tie there just taking in the slack from the connector to the steering servo and I am now just connecting up my socket for my lighting. The reason I need these is because I want to be able to remove this part of the electronics from the boat, obviously without having to remove the lighting strip. So to do that, I need a removable socket, like so. So here we are. I've now got my LED connection in place and we're wired up into channel five. So there we go. Oh yes. At the moment, I'm just running a bath because I'm just looking at the reality of getting three batteries into this into this hull. The minute the plan is to put one under my electrics motherboard there, there's a possibility of getting another one there in between my smoke generator and then having a final one relatively close in the bow. The problem with this is weight distribution. I'm not certain, done a bit of working on this on the CAD system, but I'm not certain how the weight distribution is going to work and whether the boat is going to be level in the water as I want it. So I'm running a bath so I can float the boat and see exactly what I've got to work with. Right, so I have three batteries in the boat now, uh, and she's slightly down at the head. Batteries are two in the bow and one aft, actually more like in the middle section really, and she's a little bit down at the head, but the positives are, if you look at the stern, it's still quite a way out of the water. And if you look at the bow, the bow still needs to go down by almost a centimetre. So what this means is that although the boat's not perfectly balanced yet, we still need to add 
a little bit more weight, a reasonable amount of weight to actually get the boat floating as I want it. So that's given me a little bit more confidence that three batteries are actually going to work, which is of course great news because it means that the boat will run longer and it also means that we won't discharge the batteries down as much, which is great for lead acid batteries. So this is by no means the last time I'm going to have to do sort of checking of the boat's stability in the water because as we add the superstructure, we're obviously going to be adding more weight and we're going to be adding weight much higher out the water, which is going to raise the boat's centre of gravity. So it's likely that as I go and add the superstructure, I will have to check this several times. And when the boat's finished, I'm going to have to do what we call trimming, which is when I'm going to have to add little bits of lead here and there to get the boat absolutely perfect. But this is a good start. I'm happy with this. So I'm just securing down my electrics boards. And what I'm using are magnets. So I've inlaid some magnets into the underside of the wood. And they then locate here and they hold them securely enough in place but it's not a lot of effort for me just to lift them straight out nice and easy same on this one i've used a few more magnets here because obviously it's got a bit more mass to it there we are four magnets in the bottom four magnets inlaid into the wood and then you simply plop it down it automatically locates and it's held relatively securely in place, certainly securely enough for my purpose. So nice and simple. I'm just in the process of doing some water tighting, if that's a word. Um, <clears throat> I was just conscious that I wanted to try to keep what I would call the engineering areas, this area of the ship, separate from the rest by a, by a partition on the floor, because you can see in here oil and stuff builds up on the floor very, very easily. And I mean, you know, oil's going to spray from things like these joints. When the props spin round, oil's going to go everywhere. So it's an unrealistic ambition to hope that this area is going to remain clean. But I would like the rest of the ship to remain clean because that's where my electronics are. So I've rather sabotaged one of the bulkheads, which wasn't going to fit into its correct place, which is around this sort of mark, because uh, this is where my main circuit board goes. And instead, I've fitted it here. And it just provides a partition on the floor. Um, I guess it does provide a little bit of watertight bulkhead separation, but the reality is it's not high enough to do anything serious. Um, but it just makes sure that the oil won't get too far. And this is replicated here, where I've got my next watertight uh, bulkhead, which actually is in its correct position. Uh, and the ambition here is to fill up this space with probably acrylic, so that this actually does provide a genuine watertight sort of door area. I'm now just wiring up my motors. And this time I made a much neater job of getting the wires nice and trim, exactly to the right lengths. Uh, I'm just about to do my diode, which as you can see is mounted down there on a wooden block. So I need to make sure I wire this the right way around. So what I've got is I've just drawn up a sort of a very simple diagram to make sure I remember the stuff, but essentially one is the an God's sake. One is the anode and four is the cathode. So I need to make sure that I wire up these pins the right way, otherwise the motor will only spin in reverse rather than in forward, which is what I'm after. Whew. You can see on the ship, um as I say, I was just talking about the um the watertight bulkhead in there to prevent oil getting into the rest of the ship but you can see just how space constrained even a relatively large model boat becomes very quickly and it's been a real challenge to work out where I can realistically get bulkheads in place. Um, I managed to get one in here and this is the Titanic Honor and Glory bulkhead, in fact they're all Titanic H and G, but this one isn't going to do anything for watertight, it's just uh, a strengthening bulkhead. It's just, uh, you know, restraining the side, stopping any twisting motion in the ship. Uh, that's the same with the foremost bulkhead here, which again, I've had to cut sections off because these sections aren't going to fit into the rest of the boat, but I've been able to preserve the top portion, which provides an element of rigidity. And that's also allowed me to get one of the 
uh, lateral bulkheads in place as well, and this will be fantastic for sort of resisting twisting forces and such. And actually, the moment you put these in place, you can really feel the amount of additional strength they give the boat. Um, the most effective bulkhead I've managed to get in place, and this is the only one of the Titanic Honor and Glory bulkheads that I've managed to put in uh, effectively without having to sort of chop bits off, uh, this is bulkhead number two. Uh, and as you can see, I've also added a layer of acrylic like I was talking about in the last clip. So this is a genuine watertight separation. And this genuinely does compartmentalize the boat uh, from here forward and from here aft. My intention is to add further watertight bulkheads. I would really like to have one somewhere around here because that will protect me from any sort of damage that the prop shafts receive. And I was thinking about this without wanting to sound too like the designers of the Titanic. There are a few things that are going to punch through this hull because, you know, even two millimetres with the plastic at this scale, that's incredibly strong. But one of the genuine weak points are where the propeller shafts penetrate through the hull because these have been uh, bonded in place with the JB Weld. Um, but if for any reason, you know, I bump into the pond side or I hit another boat or just innocuously when I'm actually putting the boat away, I knock one of the prop shafts and don't realise, there is a proper possibility that these could start leaking water. So it would be useful to have a bulkhead slightly aft of where these penetrations go through the hull, because to my eye, that's probably the most likely area for a leak. So I want to do something there. The other place that I do want to add a second bulkhead is somewhere at the bow, because that's where I see the second most likely place for damage to occur. Um, probably something around here. If I could fit another of the Titanic Honor and Glory bulkheads in this place here, that would give me a nice compartmentalization as well. So that's what I'm going to look at in the next video once I've done my trial running. So here we are at last. The first time the boat is in the water with power and quite exciting, I suppose. Um, this is the first time that the props are going to turn when she's actually in the water. Oh, look at those lights. That's going to look great on the water. So here we go. Brilliant. I'm going to leave this in the drink for a wee bit because I want to see, give it almost a bit of a saturation test, you know, see if any leaks do occur, anything like that. It's worth bearing in mind that the stern is quite high out of the water at the minute, so pressure on things like the prop shafts is not quite as great as it will be when the boat's finished. But um, for now, this is the first time we've got all of the electronics in the boat, all of the base RC functions are now working and the lighting is working as well. So the only additional electric function to add is the smoke generator. And that is in the boat, it's just not wired in yet because um, I've only got one of these RC switches because I might, <clears throat> might have blown the other one up. So, <laughs> so another one is coming in the post. But we're, we're pretty much there in terms of RC stuff. And so that's it for this episode. Um, as I say, my intentions for the next video are to take the boat out on the water and actually give it its first proper test in a boating lake. This will allow me to really, you know, give a proper saturation test to the electronics, make sure that, you know, after running it for a genuinely extended period of time, hopefully I'll be able to force any faults that I haven't yet found out into the open. At least that's the plan. Uh, but with, with this video, that pretty much brings to a close all of the stuff to do with the hull. And so 
after the next video, which is going to be the, uh, the, the on the water testing, I'll probably be moving on to the superstructure areas, which is going to be a lot more modeling focused. So I imagine that's what a lot of people have been looking forward to more than the stuff I've been covering up to now. So hopefully that will be of, be of interest to people. Um, but that's it for today. As I say, if you do have any questions or comments or what have you, leave them down below and I will do my best to get back to you. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, please give me a like or even subscribe if you're feeling bold. And I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.